I'm not sure how many of you have seen the old Twilight Zone show or any incarnation of the Twilight Zone, but here's what I'm imagining. This is a Twilight Zone episode where you are uh, condemned, for whatever mysterious reason, they never tell you in these things, um, to live along just one road. You know, it's a very, you're in a, in a very, very big city, and you know that all kinds of interesting things are happening in the city. And you're condemned to live along one narrow, straight road. And, uh, and then someday, some, one day somebody comes to you and says, I'm going to give you the key to magically stepping off this road, to break your imprisonment, and to be able to go anywhere in the city, north, south, east, or west. And the first thing they tell you is to go to your home, which is right in the middle of the road, and they tell you how to go on this perpendicular road that you've always wanted to go on and never been able to go on. Well, it turns out, um, and then the next day, they're going to show you how to get to anywhere in the city. Well, that's the way I think of where we're at right now uh, with you guys in this class mathematically. We know how to live on the real number line. And we've been talking uh, a bit about some of the interesting stuff that can happen on the real number line. And it's very, there's lots of interesting stuff that can happen. There's pi, that's around here. There's root 2. There's a lots of interesting numbers, rational and irrational. But there's a whole world out there that we have not accessed yet. And it's called the, com the, the, the set of complex numbers. And we've been talking about the real number line for a long time, and now it's time to jump out of that and to access what's called the complex, the set of all complex numbers, and it turns out that you can visualize it as a plane. And it's really like being, uh, breaking your imprisonment on this one boring road, or relatively boring road, and breaking out into a new world. Let me give you a very quick example of how um, cool that can be. Um, there's a, f a famous problem um, in chaos theory called the quadratic map. And there's a lots of questions you can ask about that map. Um, but one of the questions, it depends very, very, very much on whether you use real numbers to understand it or imaginary numbers to understand it. If you use real numbers to understand it, the answer is very simple and really kind of boring. The answer, I'm not going to tell you what the problem is, although we could t totally do it if we had time. It's not beyond us. The answer turns out to be, for the real number version, the interval minus 2 to 1 fourth. whoop de doo OK, that's great. We know about intervals. They're not the most exciting things we've ever found. But if you ask the same exact question for um, complex numbers, and you allow to have complex numbers, which we'll talk about what those are in a minute, this is the picture you get. It's called the Mandelbrot set. And it is far more interesting, even with this picture, it's obviously far more interesting and, and a cool thing. But it's even cooler than this picture can communicate. What I'll, what I'll do is I'll put, a, put up a couple links on the Moodle page um, to some, some YouTube videos that show you um, how incredibly cool this is. If you zoom in on any part of this image, there's an infinite amount of detail in every tiny little bit. No matter how far you zoom, you always find cool new stuff, some of which looks like what, what you see here, some of which looks completely different, and it depends on where you zoom in. And that's best done in an animated video, and even sometimes with, uh, with music. Um, and so it's this amount of complexity that you can get in the complex world, which is really, really hard to do if you live in, in the real numbers. Now, um, the annoying thing, from my perspective, is that it takes a while to get to that level of interest in, in the complex numbers. And the book certainly is not in a hurry to get to there. They don't even talk about the geom geometric version of complex numbers, but I will certainly give that to you. The way they started out is simply in a very basic way, which is definitely uh, also very um, appropriate. And it's about a story about being able to solve certain kinds of equations. If you have 
x plus 3 equals 5, then you don't need anything but whole numbers to solve that. If I have a mystery number of apples and I give uh, and I get three more apples and then I end up with five apples, I must have started with two apples. You know, grade school stuff. But as soon as you get to x plus 3 equals 1, that doesn't make sense with apples anymore. I have a mystery number of apples, I get three more, and then I have one apple? doesn't make any sense. We know what the solution is, but we know that that models a more interest or a more complicated situation or something different. It doesn't work with apples anymore, but it does work with if I owe you two dollars, but then uh, I get, if, say I owe, I, I'm two dollars in the hole, I, I have a debt of two dollars, and then I get three dollars, then I have one dollar in assets, okay? And the fact that positives and negatives can cancel out. Or it's two degrees below zero, and then I, uh, it goes up three degrees to the next day, and then it's one degree above zero. Anything where positive and negatives work out, that makes sense. Similarly, if I have like 3x equals 6, I don't need fractions to do that. That still makes sense with apples. I have some number of, of apples, and then I get three times as many. Or each person in a th group of three people has two apples, then total they have six apples. Well, as soon as you have 3x equals 5, you need more complicated numbers to solve that. And that doesn't make, it makes some sense with apples if you divide it, but anything you can divide into pieces, that makes sense, in like gallons of gasoline. I have, uh, three people have the same amount of gallons of gasoline in, in some cans, and we discover that together we have five, well, we must each have five-thirds of a gallon. And then when we get to things like this, x squared equals 2, this is what we've been dealing with lately, that's where you need square roots, and a lot of those are irrational numbers, or x cubed equals 3, x equals the square, the cube root of 3. These are irrational numbers, and they allow us to talk about solutions to these kinds of equations. And one reason why this is pretty natural for us is that so far, Every one of these numbers can be located on a number line and can be thought of as an amount of something, as long as we understand what negative amounts means, like a deficit of something. And so square root 2 lives here, and cube root 3, boy, is that bigger or smaller than square root of 2? I can't remember off offhand, so don't, I'd have to think about it for a sec. Okay. Those numbers all can be located geometrically on this number line, and you can think of them as bigger or smaller. You can think of them as having decimal expansions, and so they're somewhat familiar. But um, it is important to realize that at each stage, you are getting weirder, and you're solving more complicated equations, and there's really a purpose at each stage to introduce these new numbers. It's so you can m make sense of solving these equations. The last step in that, and the, the cool thing is there's only one more step. You could imagine this could go on forever as you solve more and more complicated equations and everything gets, gets, gets weird. There's actually just one more step, and it goes back to just this equation. We can't solve this with real numbers. No, there's no real x that solves that, because a square has to be at least zero, and then add one, it's never going to be zero, okay? But what we're going to do is we're just going to introduce, just like we introduced fractions and negative numbers, which the first time you see them look a little weird and certainly are hard to, to get our heads wrapped around, like in a grade school context, well, here's, we're going to introduce i. And it's got a terrible name, an imaginary number, because people didn't think this was real enough, and people shunned it for a long time. And the definition of i is that i squared is 1. And therefore, i does solve this x equals i, does solve x squared plus 1 equals 0, because i squared plus 1 is minus 1 plus 1 equals 0. And that's not the only solution. In fact, x equals plus or minus i. As soon as we got introduce i, it should make sense to take minus of that. Both of those are the solutions to x squared plus 1 equals 0. And so far, that's just a formal trick. And you might wonder, what does it mean? And the book does a singularly bad job of telling you what does it mean and what is it good for. And I'm going to try and give you a, some hints about that. But that's a good place to stop for right now.